Okay, so I first want to thank the uh, car organization for inviting me down to speak to you all. Okay, and thank you, and thank you to Nancy for recommending. And it's a real pleasure to, to address the parents of athletes. Because when I first got introduced to the dance community, if you will, um, I had no experience in it. I was a former professional tennis player myself, raised two boys who played volleyball and, and uh, baseball. And I went to my first convention and my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my God, these are athletes. Absolutely, without a doubt, hands down. And I asked some questions <clears throat> to the proteges and the dancers. I said, raise your hand if you think of yourself as an athlete. And two or three hands go up. I said, raise your hand if you see yourself as a dancer and an artist. I saw all armpits. That's what I saw. And then I started to see all these injuries, knees, ankles, hips, lower back. Because when I would look back and see treating athletes in different sports, there was a post-treatment that would be applied. Dancers would just leave and go get a Frappuccino. <laughs> and that was it. And then 20 minutes later, they got to take another class. And then they go for an hour, and then they go take another class. And then I walk at lunch, and they're having a salad with 14 croutons. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh no, 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 no. No, this, is, this isn't right. Because when I look at the physicality of dancers, you truly are at the highest of physical capabilities. And the reason is, is because it is explosive. It is full range of motion, and you're loading your joints your tendons and your ligaments. And throwing a baseball is one consistent motion. I can identify what muscles and tendons and ligaments I need to, I need to strengthen and stretch. But to a dancer, if you're doing hip hop, then you do tap, then you do contemporary, and you do ballet, you're all over the place with different speeds. So I started to think about what could I give as a basic foundation to start to stabilize their foundation. And the way I started to see it was in thirds. So not only overall body health, but performance and competitive health is broken down into thirds. What it is, is going to be your emotional health, your mechanical health, and your chemical health. When those three are in alignment, you're giving yourself the greatest probability to perform better. Because I see my job with athletes and young athletes is to produce the best clay possible to put them in the hands of Nancy, to put them in the hands of Tice, these wonderful dancers, these wonderful studio owners, so that they can put them on the potter's wheel and make a dancer. That's not my job. My job is to make sure that they don't break and that they can perform to the highest possible level. So having said that, Let's start with your chemical health. And the first one is, you guys don't drink water. You don't. So that's the issue. What I would like to see is two to four hours before your athlete hits the floor, starting to perform, they need to drink to thirst anywhere between 12 and 24 ounces of water. And after 90 minutes of training, you need to drink another 12 to 24 in smaller sips. Does that make sense? Because I can tell you, when I walk around and look at the students, there's coffees, frappuccinos, iced teas, and these are all diuretics. You're losing water, and tendons, muscles, and ligaments require the water. And you guys are sweating, and you're losing more water. So water is the foundation. After 90 minutes, of training hard, you need some electrolytes. So yeah, you can have Gatorade or Pedialyte, but a banana, an apple. If it's green, your child doesn't like it, feed it to them. It's better, okay? Because there's certain compounds in there that are healthy for ligaments and tendons and muscles. So that's the number one thing, is that you have to have the water foundation. Second, the mechanical health, and this is where the rubber meets the road. With mechanical health, 
we have to look at a dancer and say, what is the most important body structure, physical body? Anybody would say feet? Raise your hand, say feet. A couple of hands, yeah, feet. That's where the rubber meets the road. Now, what I am a huge fan of is balance. If you cannot balance, you cannot play any sport and you certainly cannot dance. So, there is a wonderful little device called a rocker board. How many of you guys use a rocker board? All right, somewhat, okay. So this rocker board is wonderful because it creates an unstable surface for your athlete to train on and also for you guys to train on because fall prevention in this country is actually really, really high, okay? So you need to be getting on this board. You can get them on Amazon, Dick Sporting Goods, do it yourself, it's a nice home project for you and the athlete, but they're relatively simple. And the reason why this is so important is because the second highest concentration of nerves in your body to tell your brain where you are is in your ankle. So if you hurt your ankle or the ankle isn't positioned right, the information coming into your brain to synthesize, to then send back down the spinal column to tell the muscles what to do, by definition will be faulty then you're taking class. And the teacher says, you're not doing it right. Do it again, do it more. And then what's the, is there gonna be an increased chance of uh, injury? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's basic exercises to, uh, to work on this wobble board. And we have a, an absolute wonderful uh, assistant, <laughs> okay? And have you worked with the uh, wobble board before? Okay, so, so well, first let me just ask, is there any injuries you're dealing with? No injuries, ankles, hips, okay. And number two, when you're on the board, can I touch your shoulders and make sure everything's good? Okay, great. So what I want you to do is you're gonna stand on this board and then you're gonna reach a level balance, okay? And I'm gonna be standing behind you to make sure you don't pitch off this, because that would be horrible, okay? So go ahead and stand on this board. and find her balance. That's not too bad. Would you say that she's getting like a B plus? A, that's pretty doggone good. And as a professional dancer, that's actually pretty good. Now what I wanna do is I wanna challenge her proprioceptive mechanism, meaning the nerves in her ankle. How well can I talk to her brain? Just close your eyes. Whoa. Okay, and close your eyes. Okay, so now you can see so much of balance is actually used through our visual system. So if you can't see it, we have to now use our ankles. That's why in the elderly population, what we see is the elderly individual will walk with their head down because they have to see where their feet are. As dancers, you look at them, their heads are up, they're projecting, they're smiling, they're looking fantastic, and they have to absolutely know where their feet are. Because if not, that ankle can go, that knee can go, the hip can go, okay? So this is a great training method. So when she masters this. I'm sweating, by the way. I already feel it. You already I'm feel warm. it? I'm okay, warm. okay. So, I'm warmed up already. So what we're gonna do is I want you to then take one foot and put it in the middle of the board. So come off the board, just move one foot into the middle. And now we're going to challenge it. So let's say this is an individual who has sprained her ankle, and she's two or three months out of spraining her ankle on the right ankle, and we want to rehabilitate that ankle. So stand on up. And lift that leg up. And now we got that nice wobble. Ooh! <laughs> okay, that's really nice. And this can be done as a warm-up prior to class. Okay? So this should be in your bag. This should be in your home. You can watch American Idol and stand on this doggone thing. Now, we can play certain games. Move this board over here, please. Thanks. Now, you can and face me just like that. Now, I want to change her center of gravity. Okay, so stand on the board. And please, no falling. Yeah. <laughs> just like that. Tell me when you're stable. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have her catch this ball. And I'm going to, th oh, we'll let that go. I need the ball. 
Okay, this is a 16 ounce ball. Now, I'm gonna use this ball, and I'm gonna not throw it right at her, but I'm gonna have her make her move her arms, and so her feet have to adjust to keep her center of mass over her feet. Oh! And she's gotta bend down. And so you can play these little games, okay? And then put your feet out, hands like this, squat down into a half squat, and now balance. And look at those feet go. So when she gets into this position as a dancer, she wants to explode off the ground and do something fantastic in the air. We're training her feet to know how to do this. Does that make sense? Super important. And if she's not watered, something bad's gonna happen, right? You come off the board. So at this point, let me just ask this. Are there any questions thus far? No questions? Yes, in the back. When they're on the walkers, do they have the shoes on? On the board? Yes, on the board. Sorry. Yeah, you can do it without shoes or with shoes, okay? If the individual actually has a very flat foot, I would prefer them in shoes with an arch. And if, if that individual, that athlete has a very uh, fallen arch, to get into an orthotic because that's going to improve foot and ankle function. It's a good question. Yes? Oh, I, I have athletes do this five, six days a week. For how long? Oh, I have them do this at home when they're watching TV, yeah. drinking water. <laughs> I'm a big water, yeah, I'm a big water fiend. Um, how do you feel about the ones that have springs versus that version? If it creates an unstable surface, that's okay. fine. So the BOSU ball, this one, I like cost containment. So if we can get an exercise done and increase an athlete's performance without spending a bucket of money, I think that's good. Okay. But we have to know the reasons why we're doing it. Perfect. So telling the athlete, this is what I want you to do, okay, and we don't tell them why, chances of them doing it is not going to be very high. So we want compliance. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions about the board? Okay, so let's leave the feet for a second. And now we're gonna move up into a little known muscle called the tibialis anterior. Anybody heard of this muscle? Okay, a few. How many people exercise your tibialis anterior? Hands go down. Okay, now the tibialis anterior is a muscle that comes on the outside of the shin, comes down, and then inserts underneath the big toe. And it is what is responsible for stopping the body when she's gonna explode up into the air, okay? It's opposed, it's opposite muscle is the calf. So this is incredibly strong, and if we don't train this muscle, it's gonna lead to aberrant force coming through the foot and into the knee. So there's an exercise that I want her to do. You're gonna get into a lunge position. And now, hands out and there you go. And I want you to lift your toe up. Come out a little bit more with this leg. Bring this one out. And now, up and down, up and down. Tap that, keep going. You feel that? Yeah, <laughs> it's burning. <laughs> yeah. This is the tibialis anterior. So we have to look at certain muscles that they're using which is gonna be very functional. Not a very hard exercise to do, but we do a ton of this, right? We do this all day long. Athletes, dancers, calves are amazing. What about the front of it? Not so much. If you can't do that, let's have you, let's have you do this. Hold my hands and lean back just a little bit. And I want you to just lift both, both heels up, lift your toes up. And keep going. We're going to try to do 20 to 30 repetitions. Lift it up. You feel that? Yeah. Yeah, it kind of hurts. Yeah. Right? <laughs> keep going. How does that feel? Sore. Sore. Okay, good. <laughs> we don't want to make her sore. Okay, so that's with the tibialis anterior. It's a muscle that needs to be incorporated in your athlete's training regime. Any questions about that? Yes. Is it, or she look, 
because she, she's wearing shoes i can't tell is she lifting all of her toes or like individual toes because i practice yoga and we really do a lot of feet work and uh, with toes specifically yeah like just lifting your big toe without lifting your other toes it's just lift the, it's lifting all the forefoot okay. off the ground up in okay. this fashion as high as you can go okay. and you're going to feel it as you're well aware you're going to feel it all the way up in here into this area and when an athlete and a dancer is running across stage she plants and then she explodes off it's that right tibialis anterior which stops if you can stop efficiently and load the tendon she's going to get off the ground efficiently if it's not strong enough she's not going to go and then this teacher is going to say wow you need to do it again and again and again then we can get into overtraining so maybe she needs to then explode off her left side and get off the ground. So it's the little known muscle, extremely important. Good question, any other questions? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on to another topic. And this topic is stretching. Here, take a seat. And <clears throat> I know this might be maybe new to some, um, but it is regarding stretching. And stretching, I find with dancers to be uh, sort of the go-to. Anytime something hurts on a dancer, they need to stretch and then stretch more. And after that, then they continue to stretch. And when we look at stretching, stretching in the literature does show that it decreases injury rates. So being stretched out is really, really good. But how many dancers do you know keep saying that I feel tight? Yeah, more hands, right? And they stretch. Stand up, <laughs> bend over, touch your toes. Okay, there's no way I could go to court and argue that she's tight. I, I, would, I would lose my license. There's no way, <laughs> okay? But her perception, okay, the way her brain is registering is might be off. So we might have a definitional issue. Okay, most of the time, if, an, if your athlete has been complaining of tightness or discomfort in a muscle in which they're stretching a lot, it may need to be evaluated by a professional. Most of the time, it is an imbalance of the other muscle groups around it. Chronic stretching, stretching over time, decreases something called the alpha and gamma motor neuron loop. Don't worry about that. That means that the signal from my muscle to the spinal cord, back to the muscle, down regulates. So I don't feel it as much. And so the athlete goes, oh my gosh, like right now, sadly, I feel that. That's bad, but I, I feel that. So my alpha and gamma motor neuron loops are really working well. She went ahead and chewed on her shins and like, ah, <laughs> I, yeah, I feel pretty good. But, <laughs> you know, so I'm not really sure if that's actually what we need to do. So there was an article that was published. This is a meta-analysis, meaning that they looked at a bunch of studies and then they evaluated these studies and it's related to performance. And it does pre-exercise static stretching inhibit maximal muscular performance in meta-analysis review. And this was in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports. And this was uh, 2012. And what they showed is Static stretching prior to performance, greater than 45 seconds, decreases performance. <gasps> I know. I know. Terrible, right? How many people go out and stretch and stretch and hold these stretches? Now, if you want to take a yoga class or you have a dedicated stretch class in your studio, that's awesome. You don't then go from there to then go perform and try to lift off the ground and do these complex motions. You fatigued the system, and there's a lot of metabolic processes that go on, so try to separate those two things as much as you can, okay? So separate the static stretching, excessive stretching, which is healthy, with performance. So yes, which leads me, any questions about that? So I have two kids, and one always says, I feel super tight. Like, I need to stretch before competition, or else I'm not going to be able to get my leg up here. Um, 
but I do, we've heard constantly, overstretching will decrease your strength when you hit the floor. So what do you recommend as far as right before competition for them to do? I'm going to address that in just a second, which is actually really, really good. So it's sort of dovetailing right nicely into that. So I'll get to that in a second. pushing that over splits? Well, it, it's, if you're going to get paid $10 million to do an over split, I'm going to say do an over split. <laughs> but but if you're trying to win the gold ribbon, you know, in resume speed, Iowa, I don't know if that's actually a good strategy. <laughs> okay. Because I think a lot of younger people who get into dance actually have different collagen mix, right? In their joints, which makes them more flexible. I not only do I not have very much rhythm, and I'm not very flexible, but I could play other sports. Okay, so you have co type one collagen, type two, and elastin. And the more you stretch, we're stretching these collagen fibers, but it wants to increase its tensile strength. Okay, and I think a lot of people in social media are getting likes and clicks. And having these extreme ranges of motion isn't healthy because we're actually challenging the joint capsule, challenging the ligaments, challenging the tendons, and they're 11. I, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't make sense. Yes, they're already flexible. Back to your question back here. If your child says, oh, I don't know, you know, I need to stretch, stretch, stretch before I get my leg up, I would just ask this question, can you show me how far your leg can go up? And if it goes up pretty much where it was, no. They don't need to stretch. So the sensation, the language is different. So it's how we warm up. So how we warm up is very different. So we're gonna do this. You ready to get after it? Okay. So exercise bands. How many people know have these? How many people use these? All right, okay. So. My recommendation for this athlete, she's coming to see me and she's saying, I want to warm up, I don't want to excessively stretch, okay? So I'd have her step on the band, shoulder width apart, bring the band up to here. Now I want you to squat and up. And I want her to do that for about 30 to 45 seconds, okay? And this is a really great warm up, so I'm not challenging her ligaments, I'm not challenging the joint surface, I'm getting blood delivery to the system, which actually may make your child go, leg goes up. Now, in the dance world, in season, in season, we have to concern ourselves with tendon strength, okay? Tendon strength is key. Because if you can't get off the ground and move, your chances of tendinopathy, tendinitis, tendinosis goes down. How many times have we had an ankle, knee, hip, and it's a tendon issue? Here's, this, here's the key. Isometric exercises loaded increases tendon strength. That's pretty cool, right? So in season, I'm not going to tell her to go to Gold's Gym, rack up 1,200 pounds, and do deep leg press. Maybe not for her, but I'm gonna prescribe definitely isometric exercises, loaded strategies. So one way is to have her go shoulder width apart, a little bit wider, there you go, hands up here, and she's gonna go into a squat, and now hold it, and we count to 45. And I'll check in with her in about 15 seconds and see how she's feeling. Now, isometric, iso meaning one, metric is length. She's one length here. This preferentially puts the tension onto the tendons and it increases collagen production. Yes, if I'm in a squat position or I'm repping my squats, I'm getting my muscles. How you doing? Warm, warm good. Warm, warm, warm. <laughs> okay, now you can come on up out. Okay, so this is what I wanna do. I wanna increase her tendon strength. Now. Let's get into some language. When I can increase her tendon strength, it's like loading a spring. It's gonna get tighter. 
when it tight, the tighter the spring, the higher you can go, the faster you can go. So your performance goes up. However, when we're overstretching, we're trying to stretch that tendon out so performance is going down, but it's healthier for the joint. So dancers have this really interesting place they sit in the athletic world is how much tension do we need? And since you're going from ballet to hip hop to contemporary to all these different classes, that, that requires a tremendous amount of muscle activity. So it's very challenging for myself. So when, at, you know, the parents out here, when your child is dancing, take the video, not so much to review and to go, that was fantastic, slow it down frame by frame and look and see how the ankle is behaving. Look and see where the knee is pointing. This is what film review is in sports. Well, I don't know why we're not doing it in dance. And if there's anything, you guys are flipping upside down, twirling and making it look easy. That's really, really hard. Number two, second exercise. And I would give her three sets of 45 seconds of that static. Now, what I want to do is I want to have her work on the posterior chain. Most people need to increase hamstring and glute strength because since it's in opposition to my quads, it's going to help inhibit and balance out my quadriceps. Reciprocal inhibition. Does that make sense? For my wrist to go forward like this, I have to inhibit the opposite side of my forearm. If not, it wouldn't move. So reciprocal inhibition. So hold this. Here. So what you're going to do is you're going to step on this for attention, loop it around, step back, and then I'm going to squat down and I'm going to push my leg back from my heel and I'm going to feel it in my rear end and my hamstrings. It's here. It's here. I could have her go down here, lean back. I'm loading this. And so I'm doing my isometric on my patellar tendon and my ankle joints. Does that make sense? Super good exercise. Ooh, ooh yeah. Yeah. OK, <laughs> now, now drop your knee forward. And now as you drop forward, now push your, from your heel and your hips backwards. Ooh, yep. ooh, yeah, ooh. Where do you feel that? Hamstring, glute, all of it. OK. <laughs> and now she's going to keep going as I talk. <laughs> because I'm just mean that way. So in other situations, I'm really, really nice. But when I train people, I'm not so nice. We're going to get after it. Any questions about this? Because, because what I want is I want to start to incorporate more weight training into the dance world. And not just peripherally, as a foundation as important to stretching, to balance out the muscles. Because it was... Yeah, it's good, it's good. I gotta switch legs, I can't be uneven. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do it again, come on, oh, other yeah, side, yeah. other side. <laughs> can't be uneven. Okay. And pushing that heel back, head up, chest out. Awesome. There you go deeper. I know you can. There you go. And that hurts. There we go. All right. So then I'm going to give one last exercise. So many dancers, and it's not just dancers, but athletes, and not just athletes, the population group, we all stand terribly. Our posture stinks. Okay? It just stinks. So most of it is something called upper cross syndrome. I'm going to use you as an example. Your posture is fantastic, so I'm not criticizing you, okay? So typically what will happen is the chest muscles get tight. Boom. That's because she left social media, and she's fantastic. That will then inhibit her middle back. It'll turn off these muscles, and the shoulder blades will start to round out this way. As a consequence, her neck and skull will go forward. Gravitationally, you're not bearing the, the weight of the skull on the spine. You're hanging on your muscles and ligaments of your neck and your upper back. And so it's like, 
always, always, always. That's what it is. Then what will happen, as this starts to go weak, your back will start to go tight because if she's like this, rotated forward, head forward, gravitationally, I'm more on my, the balls of my feet. So what's the counterweight? My rear end. Little J-Lo, boom. <laughs> now I'm balanced, my hands are rotated like this, and now I'm gonna go dance, or hit a baseball, or play football, okay? And then what they do is they're always like this, on the phone, right? Not good. So how do we fix this? Super quick. One, we actually have to stretch this chest out. And that can be with a lacrosse ball, a G-force gun, a massage, doorway stretches, all kinds of stuff. But we absolutely need to stretch this chest out. Nancy, how are we with time? OK. So she may not feel this too much, because I think she's Johnny Flexible. But we'll check. <laughs> all right? Turn face me. That was a bad mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was going to be for later. Grab this back here. Right there. Now, this can be an over under. So she's going to keep her elbow straight, a little bit taut. She's going to bring this, swing it all the way over her shoulders, back down to her waist. Ooh, and come on up. And I'm going to choose one person from the audience to demonstrate this, just so that we know that it works. <laughs> I still feel it, though. Yeah. I definitely feel it. OK, so coming over, we're stretching the chest. And to do that, I'm contracting the back. So it's really, really important. That's going to help get the head back. I cannot adjust you back. I cannot position you. I cannot massage you. I cannot medicate you. I can't do anything. You have to exercise your way out of this in the proper sequence. Pretty good? Yes. Anybody want to try this? <laughs> the yogi of the group. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god. Oh, pretty good. Way better than me. Keep going. Keep going. Let's give her a hand, guys. Let's give her a hand because that's, you know. So this should be in your bag. You can use this in the bag or you can use the, uh, the uh, exercise band as to roll your shoulders out. That can take maybe, along with the rocker board, that may take, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes away from the stretching. And then you can do some dynamic stretching. And then you go hit the stage and look amazing. Okay, so in quick review, foundationally, your chemical health, your mechanical health, and your emotional health. This is really important, the emotional health. Um, you can take a seat, dear. <clears throat> At a certain point, our athletes are going to go under some stress, right? I mean, they have to perform, and they're being judged, and these things. And we have to really continually ask them, is this what you want to do? OK, is this what you want to do? So with my younger child, who he's getting recruited by D1 schools, about a year and a half ago, we had to have a discussion with him, basically saying, do you really want to do this? Because if you do, you have to start treating yourself like a professional athlete, because it's costing me too much money. <laughs> you have to take this seriously. Do you want to do it? And if you want to do it, what does that require? It requires for you to get proper sleep. It requires you to drink water. It requires you to eat properly. And I know these dancers come out of here and they're going to go from this room to that room. They're smacking a pack of Skittles, having a Frappuccino. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> this could be a problem. OK? And the reason. That could be a problem is because here's some basic stats. Calories per hour. Contemporary dance is 534 calories an hour expended. Ballet, 462. Tap dance, 350. Swing dance, 586 calories an hour. 
And these athletes are going from class to class to class, and they're having salads and croutons. I love salads, but they need something more, okay? So 50 to 55% of your calories for a dancer should be coming from carbohydrates. They probably should be taking a little bit more protein than what you think. Because with all of this exercise, protein synthesis and collagen synthesis requires these amino acids. And the fats are just going to come into the, uh, come into the picture. So if you want some peanut butter, have some peanut butter. You know? But that's a lot, so you have to make a certain adjustments. And I know that in the dance world, body image is a big thing. Would you say it's a big thing in the... I think so, yeah. It's a, it's a big thing. So we're asking these athletes to go out here and perform, but in the back of their mind, they're on the social media, on the back of their mind, they're trying to be super bendy, in the back of their mind, they want to look like somebody else. And it typically requires them to not eat. Encourage your athlete to be themselves. Being themselves, there's only one of you. And how beautiful is that? Just be you. Train hard. Number two, Train a little differently. Incorporate weight training into your program. Isometric training is wonderful for tendons. It makes them stiffer, you jump higher, you perform better, and it reduces the incidence and prevalence of injury. That's what we want. You don't want to come see me. That's not who you want to see. And number three is your emotional health. So, when I'm interacting with individuals and something's not going right, I tell them the sequence. The sequence goes like this. What you think begets your actions. Your actions beget your habits. Your habits beget your character. Your character begets your life. So if something in the middle isn't going right, I want to go back to what are you thinking? That's where it starts. I can beat my child to say, I want you to do this action. But I haven't ever asked, what are you thinking? So encourage your athletes to speak to the staff, to open up to you guys. Because it's super important, because it's really a tough industry. And I think one of the things as parents, because I am where you guys are at as well. My kid's coming through. He's coming out. It is, we know as parents what's coming in life. We know, and we're trying to protect them, and we're trying to give them the best possible life, and so we're advocating for them. Is it for them, or is it for us? And I think it's a real question, and it's okay to ask that question. So, all in all, if we can pay attention to our chemical health, our mechanical health, and our emotional health, we are raising healthier athletes and healthier individuals. Whether they stay in dance or not, you're laying the foundation, which to me is my job, so I can hand them over to the authorities at CAR, these wonderful choreographers and the studio owners, to put them on the potter's wheel to make beautiful human beings and beautiful dancers. And that's what I'm bringing to you today. So with that, are there any questions that you, anybody has? Um, how much dance is too much for a 10 year old? How much dance is too much? I think it's a cumulative question that's an age related question and it's the type of dance that, that you're doing. If you feel like your athlete is getting tired, then you gotta pull back. You definitely have to pull back. But it, it's like, it's kind of set in like for a pitcher. You go out there and you pitch, you're not pitching for four to five days. We know that. But a dancer, boy, you guys are just, going and going and that's that's tough so therefore you better be really on your mechanical health and your chemical health and you better be getting sleep and putting away the starbucks any other questions my daughter she's 12 years old she constantly wants to crack her wrists and her ankles so she like asks me to squeeze them really really hard like is that not okay what should we do instead <laughs> Well, does, does, yeah, this might be more of an offline conversation that we can have, but does your child actually have a Brighton score of how flexible they are? There's, there's, a different, there's a scoring mechanism that you can actually have to see how flexible somebody is. And so if that individual is super, super flexible, if they're Johnny flexible, 
um, I probably wouldn't be cracking it. They would probably need to be more weight training and supportive uh, exercises. So I would be doing isometric exercises. I would take the exercise band and I would curl it up right here and flex my wrist a little bit and hold it there for 45 seconds and watch your child cry. But <laughs> that's going to increase the tension because it's too floppy. It's, it's too floppy. Okay. And when we adjust, I know many of you may take your, your athletes to chiropractors. What, what manipulation does, if I take a joint and I crack that joint, I'm actually turning off the muscle that controls that joint. If you're too flexible, should I be cracking that joint to turn it off? No. 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 Exactly. So they're coming in. I feel tight. Crack me. No. <laughs> Get in the gym. You need to exercise. That's what you need to do. We need a better analysis. We need to step up our game and to produce the greatest athletes because they're smarter and we're training them better. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if you touched on this because I was a little late, but um, how do you feel about self uh, myofascia release, like using a foam roller? Oh, love like, it. Yeah? Yeah, okay. I love it. A lot of times, um, for example, um, I, I will use a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, okay? And I will then say, let's say she has a hamstring. Can I touch the hamstring here? Okay. So I will put her in a position, okay, where I tie a TheraBand here to an anchor and then she pushes out. So now she's contracting her quadricep and then I put the ball underneath here because if I'm contracting this muscle, it's trying to inhibit this. Then I can roll around on that ball. So I'm using, oh, <laughs> and there she'll be ball. <laughs> okay, so place that underneath the hip and roll it around. Okay, and now push your ankle out into my hand. Hold it right there and now roll around. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so if I can inhibit that muscle, her left hamstring and those tendons, it's going to allow that ball to go a little bit deeper because she's been dancing since she was three or whatever, right? She's got a bunch of scar tissue in there that we gotta keep loose. So again, to reiterate, it's this tension with dancers. You've gotta stay flexible, but you also have to have tension. How far is that? It depends upon the individual and the type of dance that you do. There are some dance styles I've seen, it's like watching a car accident. Oh my gosh. It is snap, snap, snap. I mean, they're just snapping their joints like crazy. It looks the same as a slow motion rear end motor vehicle collision. It does. And they go, my neck hurts. <laughs> yeah, when's your next class? Tomorrow, what are you doing? Snap, snap, hip hop. All right, all right, <laughs> all right. You know, you better, you better have somebody who knows how to treat this stuff, okay? So the other thing in your gym bag is ice packs. The other thing in your gym bag is a TENS unit, okay? Do this stuff before you come see me. Because without that, then you're going to be dependent upon me. No, I want to educate you all so that you can train your athlete because you know your athlete the best. You know what's going on with your athlete. I would just visit, but you know. I know my kids and how they play. I can see little things that the coach may not. And I can guide that conversation with them. And that's your job. You guys play an incredibly important role in their development. And then the emotional health guys, for the younger ones, let kids be kids. Put them on the jungle gym. Let them do all these loading strategies. When did you start getting really serious about your dance career? Um, probably 15, 16. Okay. So 15, 16 is when that conversation starts to occur, which is, okay, Junior, are we really going to do this? Because now we've got to start training. So I don't want you to go, go out and get exercise bands and go crazy you know, with your nine-year-old. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? But if you've got an older athlete, yeah, you might want to start thinking about training and not just about bar class and putting your foot over your head. It's more to it than that. So any other questions? Yeah. 
So what kind of exercise that you suggested for someone that's super flexible but has a less uh, muscle tone? Yeah, okay, so that was going to be a combination of isotonic and isometric exercises. So isotonic is just your standard exercise. You're squatting up and down and then static hold, okay? And that static hold needs to be heavy. The literature shows it has to be about 70%, not to get too technical, 70% of your one rep max. So if I can do 100 pounds of a squat, I'm gonna hold a 50 pounds for 45 seconds. Yikes, that's gonna hurt, but that's gonna increase your tendon strength, okay? It's about 70, about 70 percent of your one repetition max for 45 seconds. That'll start to stabilize. Good question. What do you recommend for uh, patellar tendonitis? Exactly this. That same thing. E exactly this. So exercise bands, going to the gym, okay? And a lot of times you have to have your vastus medialis oblique so you can have to increase the strength of your inner thighs. Super important. But exactly this. Tendon, patellar tendinopathy is huge. Yes? Uh, over here. Well, there's three types of clicking, and that needs to be evaluated. Two types can be handled in office. The third type might need imaging. So it's, there, there's, there's three major reasons why. Yes? Um, you mentioned how kids are going to chiropractor. Is there any other things that they should be doing just to maintain their body? Um, I know that some people in our studio go to physical therapists, and they go to um, podiatrists regularly. And, I just want to get a real recommendation. Like, yeah, anybody when is who, it overdoing it? <laughs> yeah, anybody that has a global overview of not trying to overtreat your athlete, but trying to get very specific, targeted, outcome measure driven exercises and treatments. Endless treatment without any sort of a measure, you're just paying a copay or paying cash. Okay, that's what it is. And it's not just about pain. It's about function as well. So physical therapy, occupational medicine, kinesiology, Cairo, if they have an idea and they're treating in sports world, they should know this, this literature. Um, you may have just spoke about this with that rocker board. What about their Achilles? Uh-huh. Is that the same? Basically the same, okay. yes. Now, there is a difference, just really, really quick. There's a difference between Achilles tendinopathy that inserts, I need to hold on to this because I'm old and I will fall over. Hold that here. If the Achilles issue is on the insertion into the heel, you do not want to drop that heel down below the level. If the Achilles tendinopathy is up near the middle of the Achilles, you can drop it and stretch it. So it's location dependent. So a lot of times, thank you. So a lot of times, just because somebody says Achilles tendinopathy, we all want the recipe. We all, you know, what do you do? You know, the three best exercises for hamstrings. Nah, it's, just, it's more complicated than that. So if you point onto the bone and it hurts your child, that's lower Achilles tendinopathy. Treat it differently than mid. Um, Monday, the kids danced eight hours, and most of them were fine, but I know one kid came back with, like, shriveled toes and red swollen feet, and after she soaked her feet, she was okay, but I'm just wondering, like, is that something we need to see a doctor for? Like, is there some underlying condition since everybody else was fine? Did she just dance too much? Like, If it happens repeatedly, if, if it happens over and over and over again, then you need to seek somebody, because that might be a vascular issue. Okay, it might be a lymphatic issue. There's different things that you need, need to consider. Okay, but if it's a one-off, then, you know, Epsom salt, put your feet up, put up some cartoons and, you know, have at it. Any other questions? I know we're over on time, but obviously he's crushing it and we're eating it up, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Yes. We were talking about the deep stretching and the electric stem 
that's after competition, right? Like not before? Correct. Yes, okay. And then like once a week or is it like, the stretching I'm sure she can do daily, right? But the electric stem and things like that, how often do you recommend that? Well, it depends on the acuteness of the, uh, of the condition. So sometimes you can do, you can do that uh, uh, daily for up to two to three, four hours. That's in an acute injury. If it's a chronic injury, then you don't need to do it as much, and it's going to be the, the, the utilization or the utility of electric stem is going to be going less and less and less over time. Okay, but if you injure a ligament, you injure a tendon, you injure a muscle in the beginning, you need to put that thing on there, you need to activate that, and you need to start thinking about in two to three weeks loading strategies on those tissues to rehabilitate and not be passive. Any other questions? My, hi, my daughter goes straight from school to dance. There's literally a half hour between the time her bell rings until the time that her first dance class starts. Good Lord. And then she dances for four hours, and then she comes home, and then she wants to go take a hot bath. Yeah. Is that, because I hear all the things about ice baths and all this other stuff, and she's 11 years old, but she loves to dance, and that's all she wants to do every day. Yeah, I would try to encourage her to incorporate certain exercises and put it into a way that says your dance performance will increase if you do these types of exercises, okay? Because I know we're all uh, outcome driven. We want to be able to hit that pirouette or whatever, whatever uh, structure you're trying to hit in dance. But the reality is, is that if you do it too much, the body can only handle so much. And at 11 years old, she still has open growth plates. And if she's jumping and hitting and twisting, right, that's, that's a lot, you know. And you don't want to, I'm not saying you as a personal criticism, I'm just saying one doesn't want to burn out a young athlete. But the hot baths are okay. Oh, yeah, hot, hot baths are fine. I'm really more of a fan of, of heat and ice, yeah. you know, because let's say that she has, stand on up. Let's say that she has, you know, turn to the side, a bursitis issue up in here, okay? That bursitis, is, that's about that far in, right? It's pretty deep. Ice and heat may go six millimeters, may go six millimeters. So really, what I'm doing is I'm slowing down the nerve firing here so her brain on her right side doesn't sense her left hip. And when you don't sense the discomfort, you, you define it as, I'm better. No. What that is, is you don't feel it. Okay, so superficial joint issues, your knuckle, you know, the top of the ankle, when you can, you know, the ice can get to it, it's awesome. Okay, but again, we all have superstitions. When I played tennis, boy, I needed to have my strings exactly right. It probably didn't, it was probably me, you know, <laughs> because if you feel like you perform better when you do certain things, that's a routine. Stick with it. I'd never get into an ice bath, that would kill me. I have two questions, actually. Um, both my daughters do this, the hip cracks. I don't know if anybody else's kids do that. They lift up their legs and it just pops. Yeah. Is that good? Uh, you, you know. Uh, they seem to enjoy it. I'm partially jealous that mine don't, but. Yeah. Um, cracking, if it's associated with discomfort, it, uh, it's not a good thing, okay? Because when, when a joint mobilizes and you get this crack, a whole cascade of events occurs all the way up to the brain and back down, okay? And the brain is now defining this new position, if you will, and it's gonna crave that. And it may not be the good position. It may be you have less pain. So I'm, you know, a lot of people get into certain activities and, 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 and unhealthy uh, activities in their life because it numbs the pain. Well, manipulation does the same thing. So we have to be careful on how much you want to manipulate and where you're manipulating because it's not just affecting the hip or the joint that you're affecting. It's affecting the spinal cord, reflexes in the spinal cord, and it's also affecting the plasticity of your brain. Your brain actually changes when we do this. So it's really important to 
uh, evaluate that. I'm not trying to make this overly complicated, okay. but if they're just, you know, like snap, 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 I'd be like, okay, you might need to tighten that up a bit. Okay. Okay, because joints need to be stable. And my daughter's 16. She goes to compete. Make sure you eat something before you go. I can't, I'm too nervous. I can't eat anything. I'm not eat. I'll, I'll eat after I dance. Well, I like force feed her like bananas and peanut butter or something yeah. like that. Is, should I just let her go or should I make her eat? It would really depend upon how long she had not um, the last, her last feed. It's usually like in the morning. In the morning. The, yeah, that, that's okay. So if she's like that and that's what she does in the morning, um, you can get away with that because at around, you know, every human being at around three, four in the morning, there's something called the dawn phenomenon. And the dawn phenomenon is that your liver spills out a bunch of glucose into the blood. Because in the middle of the night, we're obviously not eating. Blood sugar's going down a little bit, so it spills it out. So when we wake up, we're really not all that hungry, okay? So she has enough glucose in her system. And if she's gonna go train and compete, there's enough fuel in her system. So if you know that happens, it's chicken parmesan the night before. So there's enough in her liver that it gets excreted and then she can perform in the morning. Now, if it's a later competition, one, two o'clock, you might have to thumb war with her because she's gonna need to eat. Any other questions? All right, let's clap it up for Dr. Jerry. Thank you very much.